Welcome to Wine and Real Estate, the podcast where we drink wine, we have fun, and we learn about real estate investing. Real estate investing is so much more than just buying buildings. It's about building relationships, building your dreams, building your dream lifestyle, customizing your life. What do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? It's much more than money. It's more than getting rich. It's a different type of wealth. It's the wealth of time, the wealth of freedom. And now let's get to the wine and the real estate. Let's start this episode with some financing tips from our go-to mortgage broker, Streetwise Mortgages. Over to you, Dahlia. Hi, I'm Dahlia, founder of Streetwise Mortgages. And in the next set of episodes, starting with today's, I will share with you how to align financing with your chosen investment strategy. When it comes to mortgages for real estate investors, it is important to obtain the right mortgage product given your plan for the property. Today, I will go over financing for new construction properties. If you plan to invest in a new construction condo or a freehold and you're buying it directly from the builder, you typically wait for several years until that property is ready. Although you may get pre-approved through a mortgage broker or your bank at the time you sign the contract with the builder, that approval is not considered firm. Fast forward a few years later, if your income changes or for any reason you no longer qualify, that approval becomes null and void. To mitigate the risk of this happening, I invite clients to speak with the lender at the builder's site for their approval and to also ensure that the lender has waived all conditions so that this approval becomes firm. There are also a few lenders on the street that would do the same. This will give you the peace of mind that you got an actual approval lined up regardless of what happens between the time you sign the contract and the time of closing. Having a firm approval does not mean that the rate is locked though. You will have the option to lock the rate within 90 days leading to closing based on the prevailing interest rates at the time. Another consideration on a new construction property is that the property may be worth more at the time of closing compared to what you've purchased it for. Many investors want to tap into that equity. One thing to remember is that the lenders always lend based on the lower of the appraised value and the purchase price. So, on a new construction, they will go by the purchase price even if the property appraises for more at the time of closing. You cannot turn around a day later and refinance the property to tap into that equity. But here is what you need to watch for and keep in mind to set yourself up so that you can access this equity at a later point. Firstly, I suggest that you take a variable rate mortgage going into the deal because in order to tap into this equity in less than a year you often have to switch lenders the lender who originally financed the deal for you would not consider an equity takeout so soon after often they want to see at least a year before tapping into that equity some lenders may make exceptions and allow it in six months but to keep your options open I recommend taking a variable rate so that you can switch lenders if you want to tap into that equity sooner. If you recently closed on a new construction property that was valued at a higher amount than what you purchased it for and you're looking to explore your options to tap into that equity effectively, contact our team at info at streetwisemortgages.com. Cheers to your success. Hello, everyone. So welcome to Wine and Real Estate. And I like our new intro at the end. It's kind of tropical. Did you notice chat, that, Jennifer? For those that will yes. be watching <laughs> live. So welcome to Glenn Sutherland, a very experienced podcaster. We're really happy to have you on. And real estate investor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, by the yeah. way. I, I, this is great. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, so our what could be worse? <sighs> Talking about real estate and drinking wine. That's it. <laughs> I got my glass of wine. Yeah, what, what are you guys we're, drinking? We're drinking a Pinot Noir because it's a little um, warm tonight. So it's kind of like a lighter red. How about yourself? I got an Australian Shiraz. Oh, that's nice. one of our favorites. We love Shiraz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. So why don't you introduce yourself, Glenn, for a few of the people who won't know who you are that are listening to the show. <laughs> sure. 
Um, Glenn Sutherland. Uh, I live just outside of Waterloo, Ontario. Um, I'm the host of a Canadian Investing in the U.S. podcast. I'm also the host of Advanced Real Estate Investing Talk podcast. Um, I love podcasting. I love doing a lot of them. And um, I invest in the U.S. primarily. Uh, well, I actually absolutely completely now I, I actually have sold off the last of my ontario properties yeah uh, yeah <laughs> so i've uh I, and i do a lot I, I buy a lot of properties in the u.s right now i'm trying to buy one every week so i'm trying to do my goal is to do 52 houses this year in the u.s wow. so um working I'm, just... I'm a couple weeks behind but i'm like i'm, I'm trying to pick up four by the end of this month so yeah so you can <laughs> catch wow. up yeah that's awesome <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's so, so interesting, uh, Glenn. It, most of our listeners are from Canada, yeah. and you're Canadian, but investing in the U.S. So I'm sure that some of the people are already got a good idea why, but maybe just kind of why why the U.S. as opposed to Canada? Why did you sell off your Canadian real estate? There, there's a there's a few different reasons, um, and one thing is whenever the properties are in my own backyard. Um, I'm a very hands-on guy. Uh, and <laughs> it, it, it's um, my own being cheap as well. I would be there putting in trim. I would be putting in my own kitchens. I would do stuff. And <laughs> by, having, <laughs> by having this of the properties far enough away, like most of them now, I don't even see them. Right. So it's a huge advantage for me because now I'm like, I'm, I'm a very active guy. I'm not going to sit in that like, like I'm a real estate investor, so I spent my day like out in the garden today. I'm a little sunburnt. <laughs> um, oh no! <laughs> but uh, no, like that's uh, I'm very hands on. So it was a big advantage to do that. Um, also, being hands on, I would be the property manager for the properties mm. in Canada, and I, you know, over time you learn your strengths and your weaknesses. Yes. And property management isn't one. Like I hire property management now. Um, for everything, and because it's everything's in the U.S., but you know, I have to because it's so far away. But when I did it in Canada, I I don't know if I'm just not the best selector of tenants. I just know it's not my strength. I'd end up at the Ontario Landlord Tenant Board oh, all no. the time, more than I should, <laughs> um, right? So I, I'm well versed in all that because I went through that many times. Oh, um, and. It's just by depending where you go, and it's not like the states in total, but you go to specific states, and some of them, uh, it's a little easier to do evictions. It's a little easier to raise your rent, um, and that's not all states. So some no. people like think I'm just like blasting, oh America. No, it's there's certain places. Even you want to invest in Canada, you can go to New Brunswick, you can go to Alberta. There's lots of places that work a little easier. Both mm -hmm. places work. You can do this amazingly in Ontario. Right now, in the last few years, you've made a ton of appreciation. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that did that I've learned over time anyway, I don't know if I was really doing it at the start when I was investing in the States, to be completely honest, but um, return on equity. Um, when you factor in all of that appreciation that's sitting in some of these properties, you're, what you're actually earning on your money could be really compressed. Your ROI is really good. Because you you didn't put much money in, or you That's now have it. all this equity, but uh, and it's doing really well because the rents you know have slowly gone up. Or when tenant turnovers happen, you've moved your rents up. Um, but it's it's been it's just a little easier in the states. Um, my property's in Alabama this year. We just did a twenty percent raise across the board to every one of them. Right? Nice. You can't do you can't do that here. It's just <laughs> no. <nope. laughs> there's some. I think we're at one point two here or something like that. So there, there's just advantages. We're being luxury, like some luxury this year. <laughs> oh, it's one point eight now. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. it's supposed to be with inflation. So I guess that should be more like seven hundred percent if you follow gas and stuff. But <laughs> I guess we can't, so. well, sorry. <laughs> I think that well, they, we're go they're going to push everyone into getting electric vehicles by the end of this, right? Yeah, for like, sure. Like we're starting to have the discussion in our house, but that's we're going to go way on a tangent if we go down that path. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> But yeah, no. Um, so uh, those are some of the, the reasons. Um, the property prices, it all depends on where you invest to. Mm -hmm. um, the property prices tend to be less expensive than Ontario. And it depends on what market you're comparing to what market, right? Yeah. Um, and the, the thing is, well, the, you know, the price range of the pri properties I primarily buy are really like low prices. And if I was okay. going to get those similar prices in, say, Ontario, I'd be going way up north. And yeah. To get those prices in way up north, if you're going to compare it, um, I'm still in a major city and it still has a lot of dynamics. Whereas sometimes to get those prices in Ontario, you're going into um, a 
place where primarily everyone works at the same job, right? Mm -hmm. um, if that industry changes, you're done. You're, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so yeah. um, it's just, you, it's, you can do this here. You can do it there. You can do it wherever. Uh, and I'm not the guy to push it down your throat. Um, but um, sometimes you get some better factors like, you know, you might be in a, you know, Kansas City and it's a lot of hospital stuff and all the training is done there. And there's lots of traveling nurses if you're into Airbnb stuff. And there, there's lots of different perks mm, depending on which like market it. you go into. There's perks and they're big cities with big populations. And it takes, you know, cities do fall. Like you look at Detroit. Um, yeah. But <laughs> but there's <laughs> it takes a lot more. Right. And usually, ideally, you're not picking a one horse town. Right. Mm. I'm curious, yeah. this episode will be a little self-serving because we're entering more and more the U.S. Yeah. as well. So I'd like to know about your like insider tips. So which bank do you deal with, if you don't mind sharing? Lender, like who's sure. a good lender? Well, as a Canadian. Like, uh, for you know, Canadians. You're investing in another country, what's... Yeah, what are kind the... of resources? Because <laughs> it seems scary sometimes. We know a little bit, but not everything by any means. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been challenging. Some Canadian banks are in the U.S., but they're not yep. always very friendly to Canadians, even though they're Canadian banks. So, yeah, we will. Well, I don't know which way we want to start with. You want to start with lenders, the yeah, lenders. Yeah. Sure, kind of yeah. like borrowing as a Canadian to how to do you get a mortgage? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, actually, just to backtrack on this because it just popped in my head. If you were listening to this, Francois was on my show two weeks ago. Like it, it, we recorded it like a couple months ago, but it mm -hmm. we, we aired it two weeks ago. So yes. you can listen to his adventures about investing in the States too. <laughs> um, but for um, for investing in the States, the first thing that's going to be is the sticker shock of the interest rates. It is going to be more expensive a lot more. than Canada. And if you think about how lending works as a whole, it's based on risk. Um, if an American came to Canada and went to RBC, CIBC, Scotia, wherever, and tried to get a mortgage here, because um, I actually went and asked the reverse question, what, what yeah. do here? That it's 65% is what they get um, oh, wow. for leverage for Americans in Canada, right? Um, until they've built up their whole Canadian side of it, right? So typically, um, when you go to the States, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be compressed, but you can push this. I, in the fall, we were getting mortgages at 75 loan to value for cash out refis, right? Um, and it depends on what kind of loan you're asking for, what the uh, the leverage you're gonna get, right? Um, typically the cheapest rates you're gonna get are gonna be with Canadian banks that are yeah. in the US. So, you know, the Desjardins, the National, the HSBC, the TD, uh, Royal Bank or RBC in the States, um, they're gonna have a Remo, uh, CIBC has an equivalent to. There's lots of these banks. A lot of these banks are in the states. Yeah, but they own. Not, not, most of them aren't nationwide. They're usually in certain. Yeah, states. there are certain pockets. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've noticed that. So it, it's a little bit of work to figure out where you're going, but that is going to be the cheapest money you're going to get. Typically, um, what they're going to offer you is five mortgages in total, and that includes your Canadian property. Yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> so if you're like Francois or myself. Well, it also depends where how you hold your property. So if you've held these things in corpse, they may not count. Then you're right? good. Yeah. Or Jennifer holds a bunch. I have a bunch. Then yeah. Right. <laughs> but typically it's five. And that includes your primary residence in Canada, mm. your investment properties in Canada. So whenever I started in the U.S., I could not work with um, the banks. I already had, was over the threshold. I, I couldn't work with them. Um, so they wouldn't lend to me in the States. And now they still don't lend to me because they... Uh, um, I don't have a you job. You know your American portfolio <laughs> now, probably. No, they don't know, but I, I have everything in corps. Um, okay. I, I keep everything in, well, I say entities because a lot of times we're talking about uh, LPs or C corps and sometimes LLCs or circumstances for usually stay away from that. That's the general rule, um, you know, at least at the top of your structure. But um, yeah, so typically, yeah, there's your thing and you go, oh, well, I'm already maxed out. So does that mean I can't invest in the US? No. Um, there's a thing called hard money in the U.S. Yeah, That's lots the easiest of easiest way to get loans. Um, it is going to be more expensive. Um, that you are going to be doing foreign national loans. So the recourse that those banks have to go after you is going to be even less than for Americans. Your qualifications, though, for these loans is less too. That's they it. They're not factoring in the credit scores the same way for you as them. Um, the FICO scores in the U.S. go to 800. 
uh, credit scores in Canada go to 900. Oh, so wow. there's, there's, there's differences. Um, when the first time I gave them my credit score and it, they're, they're like, 800, they're like, <laughs> It's impossible. You can't get over 800. <laughs> it's the top. <laughs> and, and no, no, you can because it, it, we're on a different scale, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, usually where I'm going with this is hard money lenders. Um, so it's it's going to be a little bit more expensive than working with RBC or TD or whatever Canadian bank you choose, right? Those are usually the most common ones. Um, so that that is usually where I'm I'm going. If you do want some lenders, just message me because I it does change. And I I know we're doing a podcast. It's timeless like people can come listen to this years and i would have recommended a different guy a year ago than i recommend now so you, I, i'm open to sharing it but it's going to change all the time who's going um the the funny thing about lending in the u.s is it's harder to get a little bit of money and it's easier to get a lot of money that's what i noticed <laughs> too it's crazy canada small mortgages they're happy but over there yeah. they want to lend you everything bigger yeah. is better <laughs> Oh, that's so very it, American. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like Texas. <laughs> but it, it, it is. And um, it, it's backwards. And it's because, um, true, if you're going to go buy like a, a $50,000 house, say, because um, they do exist in the U.S., um, no you're going to go buy a $50,000 house, the, um, uh, you don't have as much money in the in the game. Say if you had a, a, an 80% leveraged mortgage, oh, I see. you'd have nothing in the game. And it's all based yeah. on risk. So... Um, I do have lenders that will lend on a thirty thousand dollar house, but it's it's based on risk. So now you don't have as much in it. So what typically happens when you get into those smaller interest ones? Rates. Yeah, the interest rates will go up, and the leverage loan to value will go down. So you're probably doing a sixty percent leverage and an eight percent loan, and you're going, whoa, eight percent. But the thing is, you're like you're talking about like a two hundred dollar mortgage. That's right? it. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, so, like a cable or satellite <laughs> bill, basically, or cell phone. <laughs> it, it's it's a different world. It's a lot of yeah. things, and but that is a high interest rate. Um, you can get ninety percent leverage if you're doing like a rehab loan, a fix and flip loan. Oh, um, wow. lots of those things. Ninety one hundred loans are you can easily get those as Canadians. Um, typically you're getting 70% leverage on a cash out refi. I usually work in cash for purchases and then I use loans on the refis. Um, but you can do purchase loans too. purchase loans. You will get better rates, purchase loans. You will get better leverage because you are buying it usually closer to market. Or you're buying it, um, based on what you bought it for. Like the, the rate is, it's not based on an appraisal. So if you bought a, you know, three hundred thousand dollar house that appraised for five hundred thousand. You you know, wow. You, you'd love to get the mortgage based on the five hundred, but that's a cash out refi, right? Which is yeah. going to have a different leverage rate. But yeah. Oh, anyway, uh, what was the other part? So that was kind of lending. Um, hard money is kind of thing. If you're going to go searching for them, it's uh, search for foreign national uh, programs. That's what they typically call us. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want just shortcuts, just message me, and I'll just send you who I'm currently liking recently That's awesome. <laughs> yeah well, um, what, other, oh sorry <laughs> i was gonna say what was the other part of that the other part, well you know, i know there's one thing that i'm kind of burning to know is um i guess a canadian you, you're there you're investing in the states the states is humongous how do you narrow it down how do you like even pick a market like do you just like throw a dart on the board this is, this is the states i'm gonna go to <laughs> they have good sausage or whatever <laughs> how did you kind of get a get an idea where okay i'm gonna narrow it down to this market or these markets i'm sure you probably invest in more than one market yes yeah i'm in i think six six markets right now okay. so um i'll just list them right so you can, maybe that'll give you some pointers to where yeah. to go so uh northern florida so jacksonville florida i do flips there um we're working in huntsville alabama i'm going starting up a new team in birmingham alabama uh, I, where I'm buying most of my properties right now is Ohio. So Western Ohio, which would be Dayton, Toledo, mm -hmm. and down the I-75. Um, we, I have I had a whole pile of properties in Indianapolis, but I liquidated them all last year. Um, it doesn't mean that that's, a, um, I'm getting out of it. Um, I just got the right price and I had the right price. That's it. There's a time <laughs> where the price is right. Come on down and you're moving on. <laughs> yeah. So I, I am going to go back there, and I I am in uh, Kansas City, Missouri as well. Um, I don't know if that was more than six, but I think it's around the six mark anyway. Um, 
But when I was looking for them off the start, I was looking for landlord friendly states. Um, yeah. If you're wondering how, how do you figure those out? I have a podcast on it, but also just even Google it. Just go with landlord friendly states and they'll usually give you the top 10. It does, believe it or not, does change because policy changes in the Yeah, US. they do. Every Tennessee election. Law, and... Yeah. So it, it changes all the time of who, who is the most... Uh, the, the like best New Brunswick right now is no longer as friendly as it was. So we are doing like you in Indianapolis, where uh, we are slowly exiting New Brunswick. Still a good place, but not as landlord friendly as it was. Uh, that's, not, that's too bad. <laughs> but no, yeah, it's so an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was looking for landlord friendly. So I'm, like I mentioned before, I'm looking for places I can do evictions quickly. Uh, I'm looking for places that um, I can raise the rent. Um, I'm looking for the 20% rule, which means that one employer isn't 20% of yeah. the, the, the town, right? Because 20% awesome. it sounds like that's low. But that is a lot. That is a significant that's lot. That's huge. Because <laughs> those ha those exist. Because like some of these towns, even um, like my um, grandparents are from New Brunswick, Bathurst up in the north. Oh and yeah, that's all that's big. up there is like uh, Superstore and Walmart. In uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, like everything else is out of business. Right? Yeah, there used to be wow. a paper mill, I think, and that was yeah, the big paper thing. Paper mill and, and mines. The, the and that's gone, mine. and now yeah. it's all minimum wage, low management. It's yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah, so I'm looking for like stuff. I'm looking for um, you know, dynamic markets, lots of different um industries running there. And you're like, how do you find this stuff? Guess what? Public record. All this stuff is so much easier to find like you can type in what's the population and it'll give you a graph on google and you're like <laughs> well, you know who are the major industries it'll give you a list wow. <laughs> like it, it's 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 easy to find this stuff. <laughs> and if in the states a lot of the, speaking of public record you want to figure out like hey i found the I saw this house right next door to my house and it, the high grass is high it looks like not that great I'm like, well, maybe i should buy that and you can go look it up. So you can go into the software. You can go to the, the county records. They'll tell you who owns it, what their address is. And you can go send them a wow. mailer. You can call them. You just skip trace wow. on them and find their stuff. And it's it's so different how much stuff is available uh, as mm -hmm. public record to be able to look up. Um, to, and then it also helps you making your offers. You can see what they bought the property for because whatever it's recorded. How much they owe. Yeah, what the recorded mortgages are, what things <laughs> are on the property, public record. Wow. So it, it's... It's there's some advantages, right? Um, you know, just for negotiation, if you can go direct to seller, there's so much easier to negotiate because information, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's oh, power, wow. it's very empowering. <laughs> yeah, no, oh, I love that's it. It's amazing. So, so far, you've mentioned several markets. Is there one that's kind of your favorite? You think it's underrated? A lot of people skip over it. Like, I heard Missouri, I don't hear that one very often. Yeah. So we're, if we're going to go, hey, Glenn, what's the big tip? This is the big tip. Columbus, Ohio. I am not oh. in Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio is the nicest. There. <laughs> <laughs> it is the nicest city in Ohio. And I, I think not I, Cleveland or Dayton, like you said, because I know those cities yeah. had major ups and downs and. I think that Columbus is the powerhouse. Like it is the, okay. the, the it's the one that is the biggest. I believe it's the biggest anyway. Maybe maybe someone check my facts. <laughs> we <don't have> <laughs> <Google it later. laughs> yeah. But um anyway, it, it is it is the like I've traveled there. It is the nicest, at least in my opinion, it's the nice city and it, it's gonna have the most appreciation. So even if like in Ontario, if you bought wrong, you screwed up, you're gonna get the appreciation and it'll bail you out, right? Um, and the thing about uh, Columbus, Ohio. Um, they're moving the microprocessors from China and they're building a new plant there. Oh so my, that's huge a huge business. A lot of influx of mm. really skilled people coming from all over the United States. So high and, tech education. I think there's lots of education in Columbus. If yeah. I'm so I, I'm not a pro on it, but I know that that's going to be one of those things that gets, it's going to give a big boost in appreciation as they build that. And as everyone moves in, um, the same thing happened to me in Huntsville, Alabama. They um, got a whole bunch of money. They gave it away to businesses and they attracted Toyota and Mazda and the uh, Air Force expanded their base. NASA expanded their base. And oh. a lot of big stuff came in in all the houses. Literally every house tripled in price. All my $40,000 houses, they're getting wholesalers messaging me. Will you take 110 for it? And so that's not even market value, right? So the... It, those things, big, 
big things that change in markets like that will give you the boost, even if you bought it at full market value, right? So, yeah, <laughs> that's, wow. that's my tip. I think that um, that Columbus is the next big one, um, but you know, who knows? I might, I might be completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's so interesting. So you said you were doing flips in Jacksonville. Is that kind of your strategy? Are you doing flips in all of the uh, markets, or you kind of do certain strategy in certain markets? That is a great question. Mm -hmm. And yes, um, different markets work better for different strategies. And the same thing happens in Canada. Like um, buy and holds, I think is going to be very difficult to do in Toronto. But flips yeah. are going to do amazing in Toronto, right? There's different markets that work better for things. Um, Jacksonville, and I was buying down the coast there. So I call it Jacksonville still in Palm Bay, Florida, and down, down mm -hmm. the coast there. And... They, uh, yeah, I was doing flips there. Um, in Ohio, I do burrs and flips and lease options um, for single families. And I usually do burrs for uh, my multis. And uh, Huntsville, I did burrs um, primarily. I, don't, I didn't flip anything there, right? Um, same thing with Indianapolis. So certain markets, when you're running your numbers, it's, you know, you can come up with your ratio. Like I want to buy at... 50 cents on the dollar or whatever you want to do, whatever your numbers are, right? And if you want to do percentages, it's going to work the best for rentals in the middle of the U.S. as a general, okay. not, not none of the stuff that's touching water, right? Um, you'll be able to, your rent to value ratio, which that's where the 1% rule comes in. So your $100,000 property that rents for $1,000, for instance, is the 1% rule. Um, so it's, where you want to go in, if you go in the middle of the U.S., you are you can move that up to the 2% rule or the 3% yeah. rule, depending how well you're buying, right? Mm -hmm. And how well you're marketing and how okay. well you're doing this. <laughs> um, but it's going to be, if you start going by those percentages, and a lot of times I'm like, I want to buy at 65 cents on the dollar, including renovations. So purchase plus reno is 65% of my ARV. Wow. And you go and you can do that in the interior. But if you go into Jacksonville and try to pull those numbers or Tampa or any of those, Orlando, Miami, forget it. <laughs> it's just, it's not going to go. Like whenever I usually am looking at like Florida markets, for instance, I'm looking for certain amounts of money. Like I want to make a certain dollar value. Yeah, if it's not 50, a percentage. or yeah. whatever. And when, when I'm looking in the interior, I want to make certain percentages of property. So it's, you have to know what kind of property, what market you're in and what kind of things. Cause um, typically Florida, you're going to get more appreciation and you get more when things go bad, like, you know, 2007, eight, yeah, nine, that was, a... <laughs> they go way down. Whereas the interior, it's going to go heavy. up slower, down slower. You're going to get your five like New Brunswick. Percent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a little different. So it's just knowing you, and you're like, well, how do I know that? You like, just Google the appreciation rate. You want to know what the, what they're charging for property taxes. Google it. It'll tell you what property taxes are. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot yeah, of these things are public. Mm -hmm. So I had a question about uh, how you purchase all these. You mentioned hard money lenders, things like that. Do you partner with Americans at all, like joint ventures or it's all self-funded or? So, yeah, no, I am. Um, it's a mix. Right. So okay. when I started, like most people, I did it all self-funded. Right. I used my uh, home equity line of credit in Canada. Yeah. You know, everything was up here. How <laughs> my kind on the credit space? Yeah. So I used that. Did a lot of projects myself, and that's good for proof of concept, right? Because now you need to show people what you've done, and you can show. It's. I don't think it's fair to if your first project to take in a private money lender or a joint venture because they're taking the risk, really. Yeah. Um, so once you've created your proof of concept, you've shown what they've yeah. done. Then you can go. And so what I started doing was I went down the JV model and I started doing a lot of JVs. And um, I'm allowed to do main, name drops, but <laughs> <laughs> I I had a conversation with Quentin D'Souza and he's a very wise man. He said, why, yeah. why are you doing joint ventures? You can make way more money taking private lending, right? Absolutely. Um, way cheaper. It's less <laughs> than 50% or whatever you negotiate. So. Exactly. So I, I, I took on, uh, I started switching my business to 100% to private lending. Then I was doing private lending. And then I found that I couldn't quit my job back then. I had a job that I couldn't quit my job because I had so much uh, servicing for all these private lenders. Oh, no. <laughs> I was using my cash flow from the rentals 
to pay the private lenders. And yes, my equity or my, my net worth was growing. Everything was growing. But I was like, where's all the money? Because I'm giving it pay, you know, it's coming from one pocket to the other. And I never, yeah. ever borrowed more than 100% because I figured if I'm paying back with their own money, that's a Ponzi scheme. And I just didn't, I didn't feel I was right. I need to pay them back with my money, right? Yeah, um, so yeah. that's what I did. And that went for a bit. And I went, okay, this doesn't work either. So then I went back to JVs and then I was giving a lot of the deal away. And what I kind of do now is a hybrid. Um, I, I'll do probably uh, 30, 35% of private money and I do the rest as JVs. So I, yeah. I do a mix, mix thing. And that's also with everything. I like to mix everything, mix markets. Um, honestly, mix because you're not as susceptible to crashes and all kinds of things. So. Oh, yeah. And mixing strategies, right? Um, which I got from, I'm going to do a whole bunch of name dropping now. Uh, I think I'll skip this one. But um, I was talking to another guy, really a wise man from Winnipeg. And what he would do is mix strategies, right? And what you do is instead of doing all burrs, because I was doing a lot of burrs before, if you do some flips, you get those big chunks of money every once yeah. in a while. And then yeah. you keep a lot of projects, right? So what I liked was was trying to do is doing the same sort of thing. Flip 30%, keep 70%. And you you know, you get those big chunks of money. That's how you can go renovate your own personal house and do all the fancy stuff with that chunks of money and you live off the cash flow, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of what I was doing. And I like the, the mix. I like to do a little bit of everything. I like the lease options, the rent to owns and um, burrs and um, flips. So it's a oh. little bit of everything. It's smart. It's like a mix of wine. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's I like, like mutual like funds, right? <laughs> Yeah, mutual funds as well. That's how that's how well some are successful because so, it's yeah. a mix of certain things and it's it's the right mix. So I love that strategy. Thank you so much, Glenn, for sharing a little bit of your wisdom. I know you got lots, lots. I love your podcast as well. I invite our listeners to check it out. A Canadian you, investing man. in the USA. It's great. And you were kind of um, a pioneer in that space. So lots of American podcasts. Then we saw a wave of Canadian podcasts. Now, a Canadian investing in the U.S., I don't think there's many podcasters. I know there's many investors doing it, but not many that podcast on kind of that topic. topic yeah. So it's really there's, smart. There's starting to be some coming out that are, that are newer because I've been doing, I think, for four, four and a half years as the wow. podcast. Wow. How many episodes are you at? I do it once a week, so I don't it only gets me into like the low 200s, right? Whoa, so, okay. But, <laughs> We're at like 113 or something. So <laughs> <laughs> you'll get there. You just keep doing one a week and it'll, it keeps growing. I think you're doing more than one a week, aren't you? No, no, it's one a week. Okay. We do other things, but that's, <laughs> yeah, it's one a week. So okay, yeah. it's a lot of work. <laughs> yes, we'll have it to have sure you on is. again. I, I feel like we barely touched the, the, uh, the surface. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm, I'm open. I love talking real estate. Yes, we do too. Thank you. And we will check out Columbus, Ohio. Yes, I'm very <laughs> curious now. I want to Google it. <laughs> so do you have any final word of advice, something you'd like to share with our audience? I don't know. I think when I started, it uh, it seems like a lot. It seems like a big risk. And if it's making you uncomfortable and it's it's challenging what you think you can do, it might be a good step. And even if it's yes. not the U.S., if it's like you want to do, you want to buy a, a 30 unit apartment building. If it's like makes you sick to your stomach, start doing your work, doing some research and do it because it's probably a good thing for you because you will feel sick from new things that challenge you. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true, though, for us, like Costa Rica was very scary. It still yeah. sometimes is. We had um, a few issues lately. And anyway, everything sorted out very well. But. Yeah, it made us kind of sick. We're sending yeah. all that money there. We've never been there. And yeah, let's hope for the best. Same with the U.S. We're starting in different states. And again, it, it feels scary, just like buying a big building. But if you don't challenge yourself, you don't grow. So, yep. Yep, exactly. I love that. <laughs> Very good. Well, well where you. can our listeners find you? I know there's your podcast. Is there a special way to reach out to find out about your insider tips or tricks <laughs> i do have a newsletter I, honestly i've got to work on putting out more content on the newsletter but glensutherland.com which is just my name with one n um i you could probably link to my facebook my linkedin my oh my the jazz the different podcasts and you know 
I'm, I'm working on getting it. So it has even my interviews on wine and real estate. I'll put a link yeah. to that in there. And, you know, so you can find me on different things because a lot of times I'm interviewing people and I'm trying and to pull out the information, but it's nice to actually sometimes hear what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And LinkedIn's kind of neat now. You can put a link tree and different things. So there's different ways of marketing yourself on different channels. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you so much and uh, all the best. Let's drink to that. Yes. <laughs> drink. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Hey there, listeners. We hope you enjoy this latest episode of the Wine and Real Estate Podcast. Yes, absolutely. You can find us on Instagram. Our handle is wine underscore and underscore real estate. So wine and real estate on Facebook, FL Homes Corp. And you can also find us on our YouTube channel. Yes, and please make sure to give us a rating, five stars, mm -hmm. or any comments. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, we love suggestions as well. Cheers. Yeah, chin chin.